be speaking to the First Minister uh, of Scotland right now. Nicola Sturgeon joins us. Um, very good morning to you, uh, morning. First Minister. Um, can you hear us all right? Good morning. Morning, you're on. I can, yeah. <laughs> great <laughs> okay, stuff, good. great. Uh, well, it's good to see you this morning. Well, how successful can uh, this conference be with the list of absentee leaders that we've mentioned? I mean, most significantly, mm. China's president. Well, I think that's the big question. I think people are coming into this summit with a significant degree of trepidation about whether it can deliver the success that is needed. There's no doubt I think it would be better if uh, leaders like the uh, President of China uh, were here, but I suppose what is more important than their physical presence is the commitments that they give. I, I think there's a mountain to climb here. There's a big emissions gap. There's still a gap on climate finance, uh, a, a commitment that was made 12 years ago that isn't yet delivered. So there's a lot of work for the leaders gathering here today to do. But one thing is beyond doubt, time is running out and we won't be able to look the next generation in the eye if we fail uh, to take decisions here that keeps one 1.5 degrees very much alive as an objective. So lots and lots of pressure on the shoulders of those gathering here today. Well, can you, can you describe to us what success will look like in terms of this conference? How will we know at the end of it? What will be the, what will be the signal and the sign that it's worked in terms of an absolute genuine commitment from all the countries being represented there? What, what, what needs to happen? So I, I would identify two things. Uh, let me take the one that's probably easier to articulate, first of all, and that is that commitment made 12 years ago in Copenhagen uh, to the developed world delivering $100 billion a year of climate finance uh, to developing countries to help them mitigate against climate change and adapt to the consequences of climate change. Now, the UN published a report last, last week that said at the moment that was meant to be delivered by 2020. At the moment, it's on track to be delivered only by 2023. So can that be accelerated? Can the rich countries who've done so much uh, more to cause climate change step up and make that commitment? I think that's one key test. Mm -hmm. But secondly, that we come out of Glasgow with this objective of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees very much still alive. Even if all of the commitments haven't yet uh, been made that shows exactly how that's going to be delivered, uh, that it is very much still on the table as an objective. Now, right now, the collective commitments that have been made are not enough to limit global warming to two degrees, let alone 1.5 degrees. So there's a big job of work still to do to up the scale of ambition, but also to come out of here with a clear process and time scale of how countries are going to get from where they are yeah. right now to where they need to be to can make I, that a reality. Can I ask you, um, Nicholas Sturgeon, about the Cambo oil field? Uh, 75 miles to the west mm. of Shetland contains more than 800 million barrels of oil, enough for 25 years of production. There's a licence granted. Drilling could start next year if approval is given. But it's a big headache for you, isn't it? Um, SNP, obviously, obviously fo always focused on Scotland's oil as part of the independence campaign. But it's estimated that Cambo would produce 132 million tonnes of carbon during its lifetime. So should drilling go ahead or not? No, I don't think it should, unless that can pass a very, very stringent, robust climate assessment and that's what I've said to Boris Johnson it's his decision not mine uh, but I've made clear that even although it has a license and it's had a license for about 20 years there can't simply be a green light because as you say you know my party used to campaign on the slogan it's Scotland's oil oil and gas is a, a big a big feature of the Scottish economy lots of jobs right now are dependent on it we've got to make sure the transition away from that is a fair and just one but there must be a transition away from it and we must accelerate that transition so I... I'm facing up to that that's probably yeah. one of the most difficult issues we've got to confront yes. in Scotland but leaders can only confront the easy issues we've got mm. to face up to the tough issues as well build up the alternative technologies try to reduce demand for energy these are big challenges but we can cannot shy away from them. Can I just be clear on your answer to Susanna's question there? Are you, are you basically saying that, that you think it could go, drilling could go ahead um, if you were to offset mm. the kind of issues in terms of carbon that, 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 that she was quoting? So is, it, is, is, is the answer to, to try and offset I it? 
No, that's not my answer. What I'm trying to do is recognise reality, recognise it's not my decision, it's Boris Johnson's decision to so put forward a process that allows us to take sensible decisions. It's got a licence that can't just be magic to weigh, but nor can it just be given the green light. Now, there would be many people who would say there's no way a development like that would pass a stringent climate assessment, mm -hmm. but right now there's no plans to do a climate assessment on it. Uh, that, at a very minimum, must be done. And I'm asked, should it go ahead? Okay. And my answer is no, not unless it can be proven proven that that is consistent uh, with what we are all collectively trying to achieve okay. in terms of climate change. All right, thank you for, for clarifying that. I just wanted to be clear. Um, coming back to the conference, look, it, it's impossible to imagine all the nation states there not coming away uh, in, in a few days' time saying, yeah, we're signing up to 1.5. But how do, we, how do we hold countries to account? It's easy to make promises at conferences like this. How are we going to chase it up later? Well, I mean, firstly, Richard, I, I don't think we can assume that we will come out of this conference with everybody signed up to 1.5 <laughs> degrees uh, and, more importantly, everybody signed up to what is uh, necessary to make that happen, which is near-term commitments. Emissions are still rising right now and they are projected to continue to rise. Uh, to keep 1.5 alive, we've got to see emissions falling by par perhaps about 45% by 2030. So we need to see hard commitments there. How do we hold countries to account? Well, in Scotland, these things are not easy. We've got very stringent targets. We are legally bound to uh, report against them on an annual basis. We don't always meet them and therefore we have a legal requirement to catch up uh, if we don't. So that kind of stringent accountability is important. One of the things I would like to see come out of this conference is an obligation on countries uh, to revise and update what's called their nationally determined contributions more frequently, perhaps every year or two years rather than every five years, as is the case right now. Uh, we're running out of time here. Climate change is no longer this theoretical, abstract thing, you know, way, way in the future. The impacts are being felt now. This city here in Glasgow uh, was flooded, parts of it was flooded uh, last week. Uh, that is a, a sign that even here we are starting to feel uh, the consequences of this. And some of the countries yeah. represented here, for them, this is existential. Okay, and we I owe this uh, to the developing countries even more than we owe it, and even more urgently than we owe it to ourselves. One of the most powerful voices in the whole climate debate, and I think she's, you know, opened many, many people's eyes to what is going on, is Greta Thunberg, mm. of course. And she spoke um, yesterday to Andrew Marr and talked about tactics and how she completely backed, sometimes, I, I'm paraphrasing, winding people up. Let's just have a listen to what she said. And bear in mind, we've had to bleep the word she used. <laughs> people have interpreted that as a sort of um, a, an almost an unspoken endorsement for, say, insulate Britain and their tactics. They have certainly blanked a lot of people off. What do you think about insulate Britain's tactics? Obviously, you haven't suffered up there in Scotland in the way that commuters have down and tradespeople have down here in the South East. What's your view on it? Do you think they're justified? Well, let me, let me try and see what I think about protest. I'm not going to try and speak for anybody else. I'm hoping to catch up with Greta later on this morning, so I'll be able to speak to her uh, directly. And I think she's been a really powerful voice in this whole debate. Uh, protest has a really important place in any democracy. Protests are there to get noticed, to sometimes shake leaders like me out of what people perceive is a sense of complacency. The United Nations encourages protest uh, around uh, the COP summits in order that the voices of those who sometimes aren't heard get heard loudly and clearly. What I would say to any organisation is that they should protest. That is a right and a democracy. But it's in nobody's interest if the discussions can't go ahead. And what I'd say to people uh, in terms of disruption, obviously I don't condone violence uh, or, or protests that are designed to cause damage to, to people uh, or, to, or to communities. Uh, and remember this city, the people of this city, in order to host COP, are already suffering some inconvenience and disruption over the next couple of weeks. So try not to add to that. But of course, protest is important. And I think we'll see lots of peaceful democratic pro protest around Glasgow over the next two weeks. So you're giving the green light to the Extinction Rebellion protesters then up well, there if, in Glasgow. If, 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 if you're trying to, look, if you're trying to, if you're going to try and oversimplify what I said there rather than <laughs> uh, listen to the, the, the nuance of what I said, then fair enough, you can take that headline. No, I'm not you giving say a green as long light as they don't cause, da I'm... cause damage, <laughs> of course, but you, you know, well, you, protest, it's a trick tricky situation, isn't it? Because you spent, what it, you know, tens of millions of pounds on security. You've already said that, you know, you, there has to be a, quite a lot of uh, activity in order to make people wake up and realise 
the oncoming emergency. It's, it's hard not to oversimplify that. Well, I, I'm, I'm saying that I do support in any democracy the right of peaceful protests, and I, I stress peaceful democratic protests. I've been on many uh, peaceful democratic protests in this city over my many years uh, in politics, but I, I also said I don't condone uh, behaviour that causes damage to people, to communities, and I've also said please don't cause additional undue disruption to the people of this city who okay. are opening their doors uh, to those from across the world. I, I'm trying, think, okay. I thought I was pretty clear there, and I think most people will hear yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah, but do you think that sitting in front of cars on busy roads in rush hour causes damage to people and communities, or is that peaceful protest? Personal, personal view, I mean, that's, it's not for me to, to say exactly what every protest is categorised as, that's for those policing those protests. Personal view, I, I think we need to take people with us in this journey uh, towards net zero. I think we need to get people across the country, across the world, uh, bought into the sometimes difficult things we've got to do. So while, yes, protests are about getting noticed, about making sure leaders wake up and do what needs to be done, I think there is a question about whether protests that just cause disruption in people's everyday lives um, are counterproductive or not. It's those organising these protests that have to make these judgments. And right. in my position, my responsibility is to make sure my government is taking the actions uh, that are, uh, I, I think, matching the scale of right. the challenge that we're facing. Well, Nicola, you're there. You've got your ear to the ground. You're having the, the conversations and corridors. Very, very simple question. Brief answer, please. Do you think this conference is going to work? Do you think that uh, all of you there are going to look at each other on the last day and say, yeah, we did it, we cracked it, or do you think it's actually simply going to run into the sand? I don't know, is the honest answer to that right now. Okay. I, I'm not directly around the negotiating table. Scotland's not yet an independent country. <laughs> uh, but I'll be doing everything I can to make it a success. But, you know, the leaders haven't yet arrived here. They'll arrive over the course of the morning. And perhaps this time tomorrow, we might have a better idea of what the answer to that question is. If the commitments that have been made coming into this conference are the commitments uh, coming out of this conference, the answer will be no. Uh, so it's in the balance, and leaders have got to step up and increase their scale of ambition if it's to be a success. We can't afford failure no. here. The future of the planet, quite literally, the future of generations to come, and uh, in much nearer term, uh, the, the continued existence of many communities across the world right. depend on success here. So failure, really not an option. Well, we, we all wish you the very best of luck in that endeavour. Uh, let's just hope that it is the success that everybody praise it will be.